Hello, everybody. This is Tiffany Miller Lotz. Thank you for joining me for teaching through times and seasons. And welcome to Firehouse TV, where we're sending a thousand profits to the nations. So I want to apologize before I get started. I had announced publicly that we would be going over secrets of the secret place for these next two weeks. And we will do that starting next week. But I really felt impressed this morning as I was praying that we needed to talk about the time that we're in and how that time affects the seasons. And the time that we are in, this is right now beginning as of Friday afternoon, beginning the Passover. And so this is very interesting because I want to go over a little bit of what I call current church history. Um, how many times have you heard in the last couple of years the word unprecedented, that so much of what we are going through is unprecedented, the things that we are experiencing right now and things are moving so quickly that we are firsthand seeing history written and church history written in particular as we see this shift begin to take place in the church. And so in that, we have seen in the past 30 years uh, we've seen a lot of restoration of things to the church. One of those uh, being, say, the restoration of the prophetic, the restoration of the apostolic. But when God restores these things to the church, it's not just so that now we have some prophets in the church who can prophesy. He's actually restoring these positions, these offices to the church in order to bring change in the church. So now not only do we have those who are prophetic and who can prophesy to the church, but the church itself has become more prophetic as a result of that restoration, right? The church has now become way more apostolic as a result of the apostles being restored positionally in the church. What does that look like? Well, it means we think differently. Our mindset is now different, and we are looking at the way that we influence culture differently because of the restoration of the apostolic. So in the year 2020, something very interesting happened, right? Lots of interesting things happened. But most of you know that in 2019, in the fall of 2019, that Chuck Pierce had spoken and said that by Passover, we would be in a literal Passover under plague-like conditions, Right. And so that is what happened then in 2020. We found ourselves in a literal Passover and we were literally locked and sequestered into our homes and being told by our government to stay home. And we were waiting for the Passover of a plague. So this um, this brought several new things into the mindset of the church. Number one, most of you um, know that. The church was praying Psalms 91 daily over their family. Okay, that's great. So that's really good. Um, number two, there was such an increase in the um, in taking communion as a family, individually, uh, over Zoom. A lot of people, because they weren't gathering, they were taking, I know Rally Call was taking communion together over Zoom. Communion uh, became a bigger part of our lives than it ever had been before, as it should. And um, and the thing is, when God is restoring, he's trying to teach us, he's trying to impart something into the church. So the other thing, though, that happened during that time period is suddenly people were aware of this holiday known as Passover, not, um, not just taking a Seder meal like sometimes you might do at church on a rare occasion, but we were all very aware that Passover was a reality and we were now living in it. And so when when God introduced that, what was he trying to do? To, what was he trying to teach the church? What was he trying to do to change our mindset and perception? Because we don't want to miss that lesson that he was establishing in us at that time. Here it is two years later. How much have we thought about Passover this year when we're not in those conditions. Well, there's there's certain things that we know that God's trying to reestablish in his church. So one of those is he's trying to create a people 
who know how to enter into the secret place during times of trouble and trials. And so um, the, the homes that the Israelites gathered together into, their homes became a secret place. Their homes became a place of refuge and they were protected from the chaos that was going on around them, right? God is trying to um, reestablish those who have an understanding of and vision for separated cities. Goshen was treated completely different during the plagues than Egypt was. Egypt was um, Egypt was struck by all of the plagues. Goshen only experienced very few of the plagues, just the mild ones, and the others completely, completely passed Goshen by. Why? Because those people were in covenant with God. So there has to be an understanding that God wants to regionally separate some places where those, those people in those regions are in covenant with God and that those will be safe places in the days to come. We need a vision of for that. We need revelation for that. We need understanding of how that happens. We're not going to talk about that today, but that is definitely one of the things that the Lord is trying to reestablish in us through the lessons of the Passover. And there's also this, as I said, this time period where people began taking communion more frequently. In fact, 2020 uh, has been called the, the uh, communion revival. So there's something about the communion that is so, so important. And let me tell you, uh, many of you have heard me talk about Thanksgiving, the act of Thanksgiving, the act of gratitude being a secret of the last days. That's something the Lord had spoken to me about many years ago and began to drop in my heart that giving thanks uh, in a, and as a lifestyle, a lifestyle of thanksgiving, giving thanks would be a secret of the last days. Well, also, and very closely related, Paul Keith Davis had put out a video some time ago, but he uh, re-released it or discussed it again, at least in 2020, about communion being a secret of the last days. Now, I believe those two things are both accurate and true, and they are completely connected because Paul, when he refers to in 1 Corinthians 10, when he begins to talk about communion and the Lord's Supper, he refers to it as the cup of thanksgiving. And why? Why is this so important? Why would this be a secret of the last days? So I'm going to refer to 1 Corinthians 10. Let me read a portion of that. And I'm just realizing I marked my Bible for secrets of the secret place and not for the, not for the passages I would need to refer to for this. So... 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we'll pick up in verse 10. And of course, Paul is talking about the Exodus story. And he's um, pointing out those things that tripped up the Israelites and kept them, that generation, from being able to enter into the promised land and fully inherit what they were promised, right? So this is like the last thing he says, and do not grumble as some of them did, and they were killed by the destroying angel. Now, this is the key verse in this chapter, as far as I'm concerned. Verse 11, these things happened to them as examples and were written down for us as warnings on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. So you will hear me say again and again that Exodus is an end times roadmap. Because the lessons that we learn in Exodus were written down for us on whom the ends of the ages has come. So we have to pay attention to what it was that God was teaching us through them. So in this case, he's talking about complaining and grumbling. And when you read the Exodus story over and over again, you hear about them grumbling and complaining, grumbling and complaining. And that in this, look at verse 10. 
how it says they were killed by the destroying angel. What is it that during the Passover they were hiding in their homes from? They were hiding from the angel of death that was going to pass over and strike down all the firstborn. So this is pretty important that we get this. We have to understand how grumbling and complaining absolutely compromises our faith and will absolutely keep us from inheriting the fullness of the promise that God has for us as a generation. So this right here, this is our Passover time. What we're living in and what we are about to go through, there is that which we need to be able to come into the secret place with God and allow these things to pass over us. And how do we do that? We come into covenant by participating in the Lord's Supper. We are in covenant with God. This cup of thanksgiving that we take. Now, it's not like we have to remind God that we're in covenant with him. But trust me, we have to remind ourselves that we are in covenant with him <laughs> as often as we can. We need to remind ourselves daily. Now, do you have to take communion daily? Not necessarily. But you definitely need to be in a place of communion with the Lord daily so that you are reminding yourself frequent times of communion with the Lord is absolutely necessary for the days that we're in in order for us to have the understanding, the wisdom, the revelation to go through what we're going through. Uh, we have to remind ourselves of our position, that we are covenantally positioned. And let me just go ahead and, and bring this into real life application. When, when you're married and you are with your spouse and that renewal of, of intimacy, you're renewing your covenant when you come into sexual union with your spouse, right? There is a renewal of covenant each and every time you do that. And, and Paul says, you know, you have to do this regularly so that, why? So that you are not tempted by anyone outside of that marriage covenant. We need to come into an intimate place of communion with the Lord continually, regularly, so that we are not tempted by things outside of our covenantal position, so that those things of the world don't have the power to draw us because we have the reality. We have the reality of our covenant position with the Lord. This practice of communion, which, and the reason I'm talking so much about communion is in the Passover, we have the, the very foundation. The Passover was a foreshadowing of what the Lord's Supper would be, that the Passover lamb was sacrificed. His life was given to protect those within the household, right? And that meal that they took together in that house that night was covenantal. It was declaring that they were in covenant with the almighty God. So covenant reminds you of your identity. What is your identity? Your identity is one who is in covenant. Your identity is the bride, the bride of the almighty king. That was the whole point behind the Exodus story is that all these other gods had, had to be conquered. All these other gods had to be shown to be inferior to the almighty God. And the Almighty God was the one who was in covenant with these who were gathered together, hidden away in their houses. They were the bride. They were the chosen ones. We are the chosen ones. We are the bride. Let me, uh, let me take a little bit of a lesson here from the Old Testament, talking of all things about female servants that were sold into slavery to an Israelite. These were the laws that regarded those who were sold into slavery, well, they weren't really slaves. If, the, if a female servant was sold, she was actually a wife. And Exodus 21, Exodus 21 refers to this situation and says that uh, if that man decides to take another wife, that's the way it's phrased, if he decides to take another wife to himself, if he does not provide for her food, clothing and marital rights and intimacy, then she is free to leave without even having to pay her her freedom. She is free to go because he has broken faith with her is what the scripture says. That was a servant. That was someone who was paid for with money. 
That's not the bride of the Almighty God. So we need to understand our identity, how provided for we are. The Lord provides for his bride. He protects his bride. And there is, we can expect intimacy and communion and direction. We can expect that conversation. We can expect to hear from our husband. We have to understand our identity as the bride of Christ for the days that are ahead so that we will not fall into fear. We will be, we will have hearts of faith. Another scripture that refers to what most people would look at and think about it, talking about a woman, but it's not just about a woman. It's actually about the bride of Christ. When, when it talks about the beauty of Sarah and how Christians should not look to try and make themselves beautiful according to the world's standards, but they should have their beauty be that of the innermost person, um, the innermost being. And like Sarah, who respected her husband, called him Lord, and she was not given to fear. She was not given to fear. See, the end time bride has to be one that operates out of faith, that has complete trust in her husband and is not given way to fear. And we remind ourselves of that, who we are when we partake in communion, when we come into this place of Passover, where we literally put the blood of the lamb over the doorposts of our heart. And we recognize that all the plagues of Egypt and Babylon, right? All of these things that are coming on the world, all of the things that might happen around us, all of the chaos and the crisis, it can't truly touch us because of who we are in covenant with an almighty God, with the almighty God. There is none like him. He's already proven his dominion over every other God in the earth. And if we happen to live through a time where God is busy proving his dominion over every other God in the world, then we just need to hold steady, hang tight, and realize he's going to provide for us. He's going to protect us. We are his, the sheep of his pasture. We hear his voice. He will speak clearly and give us guidance and direction in these times. <clears throat> There's something very interesting um, about the Old Testament regulations, dietary regulations, and how God spoke several times and said that they were not to eat meat with the blood still in it. Because he said, when he, whenever he talked about this, he said, because the life is in the blood. The life of that animal is in the blood. So pour the blood out on the ground and then eat the meat. Now, I always assumed that like many of the Jewish rules and regulations, that this had a, a hygienic purpose, uh, that it would keep them from being sick. It would keep them from having the diseases and plagues of Egypt fall upon them, which is very possible that it was serving that purpose as well. But there's something way beyond that. Because when Jesus came and he began teaching that his anyone who was going to follow him actually had to eat of his flesh and drink of his blood. And he then initiated the Lord's Supper. And he talked to his disciples about this is this cup, this is my blood, which is given for you. This bread, this is my body, which is given for you then it all kind of makes sense. There is only one life that we are to take in to ourselves, eternal life through the blood of Christ, not the life of animals. That's a, a ritualistic thing that many cultures do. They actually drink blood to take in the life of that animal. Well, that's not what we're supposed to do. We are supposed to take in the life of the living Christ, the life of the Passover lamb, the life of the one who gave his life for us to give us eternal life, that when we take that cup, that is the only blood that we partake of is his blood that gives eternal life. So when they ate the Passover, they were to eat it in a certain way. Now we know that the Passover meal that they participated in was a covenant meal and that they were demonstrating their covenant with Yahweh. Um, if that's if you want to have a covenant meal 
on Friday night. It doesn't have to be an exact replica of the Seder. It doesn't have to have every little element, but you can sit down with your family and just celebrate covenant with the living God together. That you as a household, your household is under covenant with the Lord and that the blood of the lamb is on the doorposts of your home and on the doorposts of your hearts. And you can celebrate together that of all people, we have been chosen to be in covenant with the Almighty God. What an amazing, amazing privilege. So in the Passover, we see that there are there is a prototype of these separated cities, these places, cities of light, cities of refuge um, in the land of Goshen. So we can look to the land of Goshen and see how God treated those who were in covenant with him uh, in, in and how he treated those who were not in covenant with him, right? So there are places of refuge that God desires to establish. And this is just something we have to get inside of us. We have to begin to cooperate with the Lord in identifying and um, in supplying those places of refuge to be used in this time period. And the Passover is the reality that we are living in right now, that the plagues of Egypt, the, the plagues that would come on Babylon, that those have no power over us. They have to pass over us. We are those that have the blood of the lamb upon the doorposts of our heart. They were to eat the Passover then with their staff in their hand, shoes on their feet, staff in their hand. So we have to be ready to advance in these days. We have to be ready to move. We have to be ready when the Lord gives instruction to follow that instruction and to go with that and not to hesitate. This is not a time, the season right here. We're talking about the time and how that time affects the season. This is not a season for us to hesitate when we've heard the word of the Lord to move and to do something. We have to be ready to advance and we have to be willing to leave the land of our enslavement. Even if we have um, learned how to live there, we've made a home for ourselves. We are comfortable in the land of our enslavement. The, the Israelites were comfortable in that land. And as soon as they got out and they experienced difficulty, they wanted to return to the land of their enslavement. We have to have a different mindset. We have to be willing to leave that land and to press forward for the promised land and to realize God's ways are better. So the things that God is restoring into the church now through this uh, Passover restoration to the church, here's another element is he's restoring to us a people who have come to expect our provision to be supernatural in nature, to be, we, we have to come to expect that our provision comes from the kingdom of heaven rather than from the kingdoms of this world, rather than from the world system. We cannot depend on our governments. We cannot depend even on the natural realm. Even that may fail. We have to depend fully and completely upon the Lord and him releasing to us that which belongs to us. What does the scripture say? Uh, Be not afraid, little flock, for it is the father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It is his good pleasure to give us the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is ours and we must, we must, we must learn how to access it in these days because the wells of this world are running dry and it is up to us to be able to provide for those around us and to show others the love of God. So God is teaching us identity in this season, right? We are washed and redeemed by the blood of the lamb, by this Passover lamb. We are washed and redeemed by this blood. We now have the boldness and the confidence to come before the throne of grace and to make our requests known, and to get help from him in our times of need because of the blood of the Lamb. We are set apart as God's chosen people. 
We are those that he has handpicked for himself, serving the almighty God. He has demonstrated that no other God, and he will demonstrate in the days to come. He will. He will make his point clear that no other God has the power he does, that no other God can stand against him, that there is there is no other force on the earth that is anywhere close to equivalent to the power of the almighty God. And we are his chosen people. We are protected. We are provided for. And that we have intimacy with him. That's what the secret place is about. We have to cultivate this place of intimacy with the Lord. That we learn how to step out of our circumstances and our situations. Step away with the Lord even as crisis and chaos are ensuing all around us. And to find uh, that moment of peace and protection in him where we can hear his voice clearly. So our homes, our physical homes, needs to be set apart intentionally as a place of refuge where we uh, create and cultivate an atmosphere but then our hearts, we just have to be able to, no matter where we are, if we're in the middle of the grocery store, if we're stuck in traffic, that we know how to step away into our secret place with the Lord and to, and to find him in that moment so that we can bring the answers of God into the earth and that we can minister to those around us and that we can become a safe haven in that time that we can reach out with the love of Christ, that we are always ready in times of crisis to respond with the love of God. So this time period that we are in, that we are coming into in greater measure, it will be the time of the greatest growth and maturation and victory that the church has ever known, where where the church actually is developed into the bride that Jesus is returning for. So it is amazing, but there will be those things happening that we need to allow to pass over us. And they pass over us as we come into our secret place with the Lord, as we come into our place of communion, as we daily apply the blood of the Lord upon our hearts, upon the doorposts of our places of refuge be that physical places of refuge or our personal being. So, yes, we are in a time where we are learning how to come under the shadow of his wing. And we do that by entering into the reality of our covenant relationship with him every day. Now, whatever that looks like, um, whatever that covenant that looks like for you, it doesn't have to be ritual, Right. Passover was a ritual, was a ritual in the Old Testament. Now, Passover is based on our relationship and its reality. We must learn to walk in the reality of the Passover. Now, we must know who we are. We must know who, who it is that is protecting us. The Almighty King. We are the bride of the Almighty King. The bride of the Almighty King. We are those that are protected, provided for, that he loves the beloved, the beloved bride that he is coming back for. And he is developing us and enabling us to be able to work with him in the earth right now. Now, there's so many things about the secret place that I'm excited to discuss and share with you guys uh, over these next two weeks. But I just really felt this morning like we had to, we had to take a moment where we are right now um, on this eve of the Passover and to look at what God is doing in the church and what he's already begun to introduce to us and intentionally step into what he's trying to show us. And that we really needed to discuss that and, and really to, um, to listen closely in these moments. Uh, so that we understand where it is he's leading us and what part we get to play individually, um, what part we get to play like our churches. You know, how do we cooperate with God and what he's doing? It's, it's really an exciting time. And I can't wait to share with you um, the secrets of the secret place. And we will be following the life of Joseph from the pit 
to the prison uh, over these next two weeks and getting into a lot of other very um, interesting details along the way. And so it's not just going to be a retelling of the story of Joseph, as you know, it, it will be it will be unique. And um, I'm excited about that. So thank you again for joining me for teaching through times and seasons. And I will see you next week.